Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Dr. Noel Mosny's Memorial anti segment free paper session. Uh, and welcome to KSOS uh, 50th uh, uh, anniversary year also. Uh, so we'll be starting the session. Uh, if there's, I don't think we have information about the absentees. I hope all the presenters are here. And uh, we have uh, each paper has to be presented Time is uh, seven minutes and one minute for uh, discussion. And we will follow the uh, serial order in which it has been presented to us, hopefully. If there is any change, please let us know. Uh, the chief and presenting author uh, have to present it, present the papers. Anything? Okay. And uh, yeah, seven minutes and one minute for discussion. There's a beep, uh, which will be at uh, six minute, one minute uh, close closure of the presentation, and then one minute for discussion. So total eight minutes for each uh, presenting candidate. So we'll start now. May I request uh, the presentation will be assessed based on content, presentation, slides, originality, and then added to total. So myself, Dr. Ganesh, Dr. Kavita, and uh, Dr. Madhu. Udaraju are the judges for this session. May I request uh, the first uh, presenting author, Dr. Chandrakant, to present his paper. Bacon emulsification for cataract in post C3R linked keratoconus eyes, a study on 25 eyes for two years. Dr. Chandrakant. Good morning, everyone. The title of the paper is uh, Fake Emulsification for Cataract in Post Collagen uh, Cross Link Eyes, a study on uh, 25 eyes, prosthetic study for three years. I'm Dr. Chandra Khan. The aim of the study is to uh, study the visual acuity complication progress in collagen cross link eyes with cataract after fake emulsification with foldable intraocular lens uh, implantation. 25 eyes which underwent collagen cross-linking for keratoconus and cataract were selected for this study. A minimum period of three years after collagen cross-linking was the cutoff period. All eyes had uh, undergone collagen cross-linking elsewhere. It was a prospective study. Patients with any systemic uh, disease were excluded from this study. This is a demographic, uh, demographic pattern. Uh, as you see, uh, majority of the patients are between 25 to 45 years. This is a graph. Uh, duration of uh, C3 and FACO. Uh, um, six eyes uh, uh, had, uh, I mean, 12 eyes had uh, six years uh, post C3R, eight eyes five years post C3R, uh, C3R and five eyes four uh, years post C3R. This is a graph. Best uh, character visual equity is preoperative was uh, 618 in 2 eyes, 624 in 5 eyes, 636 in 7 eyes, 6 by 60 in 11 eyes. What are the preoperative visual equity? The visual equity, refractive status, dynamic and uh, static, split lab examination to know the details of the um, cornea, the status of uh, the cornea, uh, how uh, the opacity is uh, central uh, or periphery, topography, patchy meat in all cases. Uh, this was done to see the, whether, whether the, uh, there's a progression after the uh, cataract surgery. Uh, then you got an A scan uh, uh, optical. The formula used was uh, SRKT with Barrett's also. Clear corneal incision on the, the this is a pro operative procedure. Clear corneal incision on the steep meridian, capsular axis. Um, the um, toric lenses, uh, uh, in case uh, toric lenses were kept, uh, you had to uh, mark it with using a slit lamp. Uh, and with the toric marker. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, clear corneal incision on the steep meridian, capsular axis, under viscoelastics, hydro dissection, the hydro delineation, phaco chop, direct chop and chop, cortex epinucleus aspiration, foldable toric aisle implantation to the bag, under viscoelastics, uh, self sealed uh, wound hydration. Small video presentation. On the temporal axis, you do the opening. You can see the 
corner with the opacity in the center there. Visco elastics after uh, the interior capsule rex is around 5.5 to 6 millimeters. Hydro delineation, hydro this section, loosen the uh, nucleus. Then you start the fake emulsification. Stop and shop. Epidicris is removed under viscoelastics. The aisle is implanted. Is placed in the back. You can see the corneal opacity is uh, advanced case of keratoconus. Take care to see that uh, it is covered. the uh, toric lenses are kept in the proper axis, so it is already marked. This is a visual equity uh, chart. Uh, at the end of uh, three years, five years is at six by six, eight eyes at six by nine, six by twelve in six eyes, six, uh, two eyes had 618, two eyes had 6 by 24, and uh, two eyes had uh, 6 by 36. Uh, results at a glance. Five years had a character visual record of 6 by 6, eight eyes 6 by 9, six eyes 6 by 12, one eye had 6 by 36. And then uh, one, one year, uh, one eye had a uh, uh, thick uh, capsule, post capsule opacification, we don't have a yak capsule autonomy. To conclude, eyes with keratoconus and cataract could be managed well by taking precautions with the, in case of the opacity on the cor hazy cornea, with the abundant use of uh, viscoelastics and uh, uh, keeping the low parameters uh, on a FACO parameters. These are my references. Thank you. Yes, sir. No, no. I mean, no, no. Systemic disease is excluded. I already mentioned about that. No. Systemic disease is excluded. SRKT. Yeah. All this is a descriptive statistic. Any inferential statistics will be much helpful. Whether, uh, in a sense, we, you know, if you have a uh, power set at a particular value, what is the improvement? And then six by six, of course, it's very difficult to assess how many patients improve, how many do not. If you can convert it into a decimal value or log mark, huh. and then come out with the inferential side, that will be helpful. This is, of course, uh, like if you have visual equity that shows the. Uh, efficacy of the treatment. Mm. Uh, we also have to look into the safety profile. So uh, something like uh, endothelial cell count, huh. uh, complications, all that uh, will also be very helpful in uh, the safety of the procedure. Yeah, um, uh, we, had, we had done a topo uh, after the surgery also. Uh, after one year, we had done a topography and a patchimate, everything to see whether there's a progress of the keratoconus in these days. There was uh, no positive thing on that. see that here. So it's not mentioned <laughs> because I didn't mention that because there was no uh, proper inference we got from that. There was no progress in it. Okay. Yeah, but mm. outside they were done also. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's that's why I didn't mention about that. Yeah. That's why I didn't mention because I, we didn't have any uh, pre-operative data on that account, right? So that's why I kept a mini. Mm. That's what because that's what they, they all three years. Uh, uh, yes, post three, post three. Yes, that's why I took it up. Uh, 
that's why that's why i took this uh, this particular video because of that uh, opus certification i took that video but um, i think we didn't have much problems on that account we use uh, and uh, all these cases we use high end uh, visco elastics and all and uh, for uh, uh, the main part is uh, the rexis part which you have to do a uh, staining and all but then uh, with the high end of uh, fake machines i think it's not a big problem welcome welcome Uh, the next presenting author, uh, Dr. S. J. Sai Kumar, to present his talk on. Oh, this is your video. Uh, author, Dr. Shruti. Okay. Ah, okay. 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 Okay
The risk of intraoperative complications were 36.68% in eyes with anterior chamber depth less than 2.5 mm compared to 14.9 in eyes with AC depth more than or equal to 2.5 mm. And the pupil dilatation did not have any significant association with complications. Preoperatively, mild phacodonosis was noted only in three eyes and the actual intraoperative zonal dehiscence was present in 31 eyes. So this shows the importance of her study. Coming to the discussion, the production of pseudoexfoliation material by the non-pigmented ciliary epithelium and the preoperatorial lens epithelium causes typical alterations in the zonules at their origin and attachment. And this along with the proteolytic activity of the lysosomal enzymes in the pseudoexfoliation deposits causes zonal disintegration. This causes anterior movement of the lens and increased curvature of the lens, which in turn causes the shallowing of the AC and increased lens thickness. The ratio between axial length and the anterior chamber depth this was not used in studies to, uh, before to our knowledge and this shows a relative anterior segment crowding and this is due to the anterior movement of the lens iris diaphragm due to zonal weakness and this was found significantly higher in uh, eyes with the group of complications. There were only two studies uh, previously uh, regarding the association of AC depth and the chance of intraoperative complications and compared to the, their studies, our study had a higher sample size, mean age was similar, sex predilection was male, and the A-scan used was optical A-scan in our study. Other two studies used ultrasound A-scan. Cataract surgery was by uh, fake emulsification in ours and the Kushle um, et al. study, but uh, Praveen V. et al. used small incision cataract surgery patients. Uh, zonal uh, dehiscence percentage was slightly higher in our population our, uh, group. PC rent was similar. In all the three studies, the AC depth was significantly lower in patients with complications. But in our study, we also got the result that uh, increased lens thickness and increased axial length by AC ratio were significantly associated with intraoperative complications. So our study is the first study in South Indian population analyzing the association of optical A-scan parameters and intraoperative complications during fake emulsification in patients with pseudoxfolation. And the limitations of our study being retrospective nature, and we included the weak backs along with the zonal dehiscence. To conclude, preoperative shallow anterior chamber and increased lens thickness are the indications of zonal instability in pseudoexfoliation syndrome. Anterior chamber depth of less than 2.5 millimeter is a high risk factor for complications during fake emulsification. And cataract surgeons should take caution while operating such patients, anticipating possible intraoperative complications. These are our references. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, nice presentation. Can you just get back to the, uh, the A-scan parameter slide? There's a table there uh, where you have uh, compared with. Yes, yes. Not this one, the other one. With axial length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Axial length is, uh, is it significant or not? Axial length is not significant. Not significant, Alone right? is not significant. No. AC depth, and, AC depth and, and lens thickness are significant and the ratio is significant. The movement, anti the movement of the lens. The length of the AC ratio, you should do a lens fault study. Yes. A so city, A so city, you could have yeah. done this. Uh, nevertheless, it's okay. We, we have done whatever yeah. there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then you have to buy another machine and yeah. that to be done. But what is actually reflects is your anterior lens fold. But uh, another thing is uh, the pupil size didn't really matter, is it? Uh, it in, in our study, we didn't get a, a significant a correlation surgeon? with the uh, uh, small pupil size and intraoperative complications that in uh, moderate dilatation and good dilatation as well, there were uh, intraoperative complications. Oh, you used pupil expanders? Yeah, uh, that may be because case, uh, they used uh, pupil expanders. What is the reference? What is the present study you should uh, sort of compare it with now? Because we have the... Yeah. When was it published last? Uh, um, 
these two were the study also the pupil diameter was 7 mm nothing they were didn't have very good uh, mm. pupil dilatation so one <coughs> so we have to you know see how we can even reduce this further yes Once you know pseudo exposition we, we have to anticipate all these things yes uh, because uh, head to head comparison that study at 6 years they had 50% less complications mm. uh, so that will sort of uh, become sort of maybe become the benchmark we don't know mm. very difficult to manage to fix to the study why were you not able to do it prospectively yeah <laughs> <laughs> because definitely you would have missed follow ups you have missed uh, uh, yeah. 200 is no of 183 patients, how many patients? 184 patients. 184 patients. So definitely you would have, there's some lot to follow up, yes. some not, patients not able to come out. So better to do prospectively rather mm. than retrospectively. Yeah. 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 You can do it prospectively. Okay. I call upon Dr. Rakhi D. Cruz uh, to present FP44, the eye and tick bone disease, a study from South India. Candidate is not there. Absent, okay. Then I next call upon Dr. Anshia Mol, BA, to present her paper, FP80, Etiology and Management of IOP Rise Falling Posterior Chamber Fake Intraocular Lens Implantation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my topic is etiology and management of IOP rise following posterior chamber fakic IOL implantation in myopic patients. No financial interest. So, fakic IOLs provides an effective solution for uh, high refractive error candidates who are not suited for corneal refractive treatments. And uh, fakic IOLs are in great demand because of their advantage like faster visual recovery, high efficacy, and reversibility. Currently, there is only one FDA-approved posterior chamber uh, uh, fakic IOL, which is implantable columnar lens ICL, which was released by Star Surgicals, uh, which was made up of a biocompatible material called columnar, which is a blend of polymer and collagen. And uh, this, um, uh, this has a plate haptic design and an anterior lens vaulting, which is designed to prevent the crystalline lens contact. The vaulting predisposes the eye uh, to pupillary block glaucoma. To prevent this, a peripheral hydrotomy is suggested uh, before placing the V4B model. But the latest B4C model has a central flow technology, which has a 0.36 millimeter uh, central aperture uh, called the aquaport for the flow of uh, aqueous flow, which prevent the pupillary block. Hence, peripheral hydrotomy is not needed in this uh, lens model. Uh, the mechanisms of IOP rise uh, reported includes uh, steroid response, retained visco, uh, pupillary block, etc. 
Uh, retained viscoelastic or intraoperative AC overfill uh, was managed by conservative management with oral and topical anticlocoma medications. Uh, steroid response was managed either by stopping topical uh, prednisolone eye drops or switching to low potent uh, steroid drops and adding anticlocoma medications as needed. Pupillary block uh, needed a peripheral iridotomy or en enlargement of an existing PI. Pre-existing uh, juvenile open angle glaucoma needed uh, AGMs for IOP control and malignant glaucoma needed past plana vitrectomy and peripheral iridozone low hyaldo vitrectomy along with AC reformation and AGMs as needed. Aim of our study was to evaluate the various etiologies for uh, raised intraocular pressure following phagic ICL V4C model implantation in myopic eyes to discuss their management and outcomes in a consecutive case series. So this was a retrospective study uh, conducted on all myopic patients who underwent ICL implantation during the period of uh, August 2015 and January 2023. All patients underwent a complete ophthalmic evaluation uh, and an ICL surgery was performed by a single surgeon under topical anesthesia, a 3 mm temporal clear corneal incision and two paracentis is made. AC filled with 2% uh, HPMC, ICL injected into the AC, food plates uh, tucked beneath the iris, visco washed out using uh, automated coaxial uh, irrigation and aspiration with BSS solution and the pupil constricted with pilocarpine. Postoperatively, uh, all patients were treated with topical prednisolone 1% eye drops uh, given, on, uh, given as tapering doses uh, for 6 weeks and uh, topical moxifloxacin 0.5% eye drops given uh, 4 times a day uh, for 1 week. And uh, the follow-up uh, data was cal collected on uh, first day, one week, one month, and three months. An IOP of more than or equal to uh, 21 millimeter of mercury and two separated uh, separate occasions was defined as ocular hypertension. And uh, IOP of more than or equal to 21 millimeter of mercury with glaucomatous disc of field changes was defined as glaucoma. So these are the demographics and characteristics uh, of the subjects uh, taken for the study. Males to female ratio is 31 is to 34. Uh, mean age of subjects with raised IOP was 28.32 uh, years. Uh, mean refractive error in diopters was minus 10.14. Uh, mean preoperative IOP was 13 and mean postoperative IOP found was 14.26. Uh, Goniosopy status was open angles in all patients. Um, out of the total 412 eyes who underwent ICL implantation, 65 eyes, that is 15.78% of eyes had uh, IOP rise. And the mean time for post-op IOP rise was 18.82 days. The time of onset for IOP spike was, uh, in day one follow-up, 11 eyes had um, IOP spike. In one week follow-up, 14 eyes um, uh, noted IOP uh, spike. And one month follow-up, 40 eyes noted uh, high IOP. The possible mechanisms of raised IOP in our cohort was, um, one is retained visco in 17% of eyes, which is 11 eyes. Um, they had um, uh, they had uh, raised IOP in the immediate post-op period and uh, this can be also be due to intraoperative anterior chamber overfill and uh, uh, other group that is 54 eyes that is 83% of the uh, uh, eyes had steroid response they had IOP under control in the immediate post-operative period but subsequently increased during uh, follow-up no excess intraocular inflammation was noted. Out of 54 eyes, uh, 14 eyes was uh, found to be having high IOP in the one week follow-up and 40 eyes in the one month follow-up. 0.8 to 26.2% of post-ICL implantation eyes have reported high IOP rise. In our case series, uh, we got 15.78% uh, of uh, subjects developed IOP rise. Multiple mechanisms included uh, also, the eyes with high myopia are at a higher risk of steroid-induced uh, ocular hypertension and primary open-angle glaucoma. Steroid-induced IOP rise was usually within one to four weeks, uh, which is reported as a common cause. In our, uh, common cause, our case also reported 83% of steroid response, which was noted between one to two weeks of uh, follow-up. Uh, if diagnosed early and intervened appropriately, this may not lead to glaucoma. Glaucomatous optic nerve damage uh, occurs if uh, IOP remains elevated for a prolonged period. Changing to low potent steroid drops along with short course of AGM is needed in this uh, in this group. Six size required AGM beyond three months to control uh, the IOP in our study. The second uh, reason uh, was retained viscoelastic or overfill of the anterior chamber. This presence in the immediate post-op period often results with short course of anti-glaucoma and in anti-inflammatory medication. 
more common with high viscous OVD like sodium hyaluronate uh, compared to HPMC. We used 2% HPMC in all our cases and OVD was removed using coaxial irrigation and aspiration. Despite this, we had 11 eyes with raised IOB due to retained OVD. 8 out of the 11 eyes resolved within 1 week with AGM and 3 eyes were on topical AGMs at the final follow-up. V4C model of uh, ICL was used uh, in our study, so pupillary block was not reported. A total of 9 eyes needed AGM beyond final follow-up period. None of the eyes needed ICL explantation in our case series and none of the eyes developed any glaucomatous disc damage or vision loss during the follow-up period. So, uh, conclusion, elevated intraocular pressure is not uncommon following fake IOL implantation, 16% in our series. Steroid response was the most uh, common etiology for elevated IOP followed by retained viscoelastics in our study. Timely recognition with proper and prompt management of elevated IOP helps in preventing optic nerve damage. These are my references. Thank you. So, uh, preoperatively, Gonia was done in all the patients. Yes. Uh, for all the, I think, 400 eyes. Yes. Sir. In total. And postoperatively also. What yes. device was used to measure the uh, uh, intraocular pressure? Uh, Goldman applanation. <laughs> for all the patients, you yes, had yes. Goldman applanation. Okay. showed some case of juvenile glaucoma and yes sir. that was uh, um, reported in um, main reference yeah, not in, your not in my uh, study uh, this was reported in a similar study yeah. they uh, had more um, patients actually more follow up the cases had pi in this all of them you used the center v4c we used so none of them reported with pi i mean um, pupillary block no no huh? did you do any prophylactic pi pi not done because we were using now that the v4b b model is not available nowadays so before okay. c only so we were not using because of because it is already a hole right. you did not mention the central corneal thickness of these patients why <laughs> that was not done. A complete evaluation was done. I, I didn't take that see, uh, central corneal thickness as a parameter. So progressively over the period of years, as ICL has been written, is the is the rate of complication of secondary glaucoma reducing or is it remaining it the same? As you see the publications, that's why I'm asking. It's increasing actually. Like secondary glaucoma, even even as with the use of V4C, yeah. uh, pupillary block has been reported. Not in my study, but um, this my study had a follow up of three months only. It's a short term, but in long term, um, there are reports like. So in some centers, I have seen that PI is done, mm. even if they are using V4C. V4C. PI is done prophylactically and then putting a. Yes, so, so pupillary it. glaucoma is actually not the most common complication. It's so actually no, an open sure. angle glaucoma. Which yes. If it is a pupillary block glaucoma, that means something else has was supposed to be done has not been done. For example, you have not ruled out angle closure in mm -hmm. myopes. That also has known mm -hmm. to occur. Mm -hmm. So proper evaluation is not done. So that's a different entity. But we're talking about only open angle, so. you don't get so much uh, if you are doing it you know, in a methodological manner. So complication related to open angle glaucoma actually report wise they may be reducing okay. so we have to see how much we can bring down 15% mm -hmm. to even lesser okay. because since we do we hardly have uh, i think 4 or 3 or 2% patients okay. on uh, mm -hmm. secondary glaucoma 15% is quite high okay. yeah because okay. just imagine the plight of the patient yeah. post op protocol you huh. can change it because in pr case also when we do higher powers sir. as you have rightly pointed out myopic patients have no, this tendency more, to respond oh, yes sir. so maybe after first two weeks of dexamethasone or prednisolone mm. you can go change for, to uh, low potent oh, okay. lotiprednol now is available in higher strength also okay huh. one person one person no. so that you can shift so that uh, the comp comp uh, certain steroid response can be reduced okay. higher maybe in that uh, the number is, seems more because of your initial visco related thing yes, that you need not count as glaucoma, I think. Yeah. 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 Transient. That is transient. So if you remove that number, it, percentage okay, it comes down. down. Okay. The central corneal thickness is a very important guiding factor. Mm -hmm. so it will tell you what patients are likely to have in the entire view. Along with that, if you have corneal thickness, it's better. Okay. But uh, for everything you have to add a machine related to glaucoma, that's the headache. But uh, central corneal thickness is about telling you and uh, what is the likely of. Uh, Going in for it. 
lower facilities have a tendency to have a higher risk for okay, okay. So in your exclusion criteria you would have excluded glaucoma right yes you yes, would have excluded yes, glaucoma sure, yeah so uh, based on what <laughs> she think it's a retrospective study no so what now the thing to be uh, learned or carry home message would be that you when you are evaluating what are the parameters you want to evaluate just only iop or other things also you want to evaluate you uh, would have done gonio and yes, you would have done iop yes ma'am isn't it so, now the told... other two things is uh, whether you want to include uh, fields and uh, Uh, pachymetry invariably these are actually all, in uh, that com- com- uh, before uh, before the, even in that complete uh, patient evaluation fields is also included i didn't um, uh, tell it but then uh, pachymetry also will come no because you are uh, uh, i didn't take that parameter i mean uh, for the for evaluation analysis, analysis i didn't take but every test topography, topography everything will be done including hfa because you have to Mm. I didn't take that parameter for analysis. I didn't take. Yeah. It is actually a waste lot of chair time for you after the procedure. Mm-hmm. You know, mm. then you go to another department. Another person has to see. They have to counsel, and then they have to treat. They have to follow for three months. You know, it wastes so much of time. So if you can avoid it, mm-hmm. the initial itself, then it's much much better. Okay. Okay. So this is a nice point you can take up. Now, okay. So. The first two weeks you can use the strongest. Stronger and yeah. then later yeah. low yeah. potent. Yeah. Yeah. Higher, but oh, okay, sir. Okay. okay. Numbers are more in that. Uh, uh-huh. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. uh we don't have uh, dr john davis akra is absent okay then we request dr nina chris william fp204 to present the paper on comparing ocular thermography at different temperatures using idea intelligent dry eye analyzer good morning my paper is on comparing the ocular thermography at different temperatures using intelligent dry eye analyzer Dry eye disease, as you know, is a multifactorial disease, and it is caused by the loss of tear film homeostasis. And the most frustrating part of dry eye is the debilitating symptoms, the lack of relief from symptoms, and the difficulty in diagnosis. So there are already several parameters available uh, in the uh, market right now to analyze dry eye, like the tear film stability test, tear breakup time, tear film volume is measured using uh, Schirmer's test, uh, ocular staining, inflammatory markers, and nebography. but in spite of the existence of all these tests we are still uh, unable to explain why some people are symptomatic so we it probed us to search into other parameters so as you know that the lipid layer is responsible for maintaining the evaporation of the tear film thermography permits an indirect evaluation of the evaporation rate and it uses a thermography camera which operates in the infrared range and this concept was introduced in 1968 by mapstone however there is no commercially available instrument so our hypothesis was the change in environmental conditions in terms of temperature and humidity alters the ocular surface temperature and will trigger the pain receptors uh, causing dry eye symptoms in those who are vulnerable the aim of our study was to compare the ocular surface thermographic changes with help of severity scores in subjects with dry eye symptoms and asymptomatic individuals at the ambient room temperature and humidity and in a temperature and humidity controlled environment using a novel device called the intelligent dry eye analyzer so we did a cross sectional study in a tertiary care hospital and sample size was 24 we included all those patients uh, those healthy volunteers in the age group of 18 to 60 years and we excluded those people who had history of any ocular disease were on any ocular medication or systemic medication which altered the ocular surface and uh, those who have undergone any ocular surgical intervention so initially we asked the patients to 
uh, complete the OSTI questionnaire on their phones using a QR code based method. And those who had scored uh, 12 and above uh, were classified as normal group and those who have uh, 12 and below were in the normal group and those who had scored 13 and above were in the symptomatic group. An OSTI questionnaire is a valid and reliable index to assess dry eye and it has three subscales that is the ocular symptom subscale, the vision subscale and the environmental trigger subscale. So we studied our patients in two uh, settings that is the ambient environmental temperature that is at 25 to 27 degrees with relative humidity of 70 to 75 percent and the control temperature was 20 to 22 degrees with relative humidity of 55 to 60 percent. So this is a novel device which is based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, it has two versions, one is a standalone version on the left and the right you can see the slit lamp clip on version. So this machine analyzes the ocular surface thermography, it does the infrared imaging, uh, the tear breakup time, mebography, blink rate and it finally it gives us a tear film instability. So here the patient is made to sit on the slit lamp, you can select the mode and initially the mebography is done of the lower lid and the upper lid. Then the patient is asked to blink normally for 30 seconds and the restricted blink mode, the ocular surface thermography is measured. Also the tear film breakup time can be assessed. So this is a report generated. The first few two images are of the amoebography and the last two are of the ocular surface thermography changes. Uh, and this machine gives a severity score which is an analysis of the ocular surface temperature changes. As you can see, uh, the color code, the darker color signifies warmer temperature and the lighter colors, colder temperature. So our results, our mean age group was 28 years. We had 7 males and 17 females. Um, out of uh, the OSDI score, uh, 14 people were normal and 10 were in the symptomatic group. So we compared the severity scores of those who scored normal on the OSDI score and those who were symptomatic on the OSDI score at the two temperatures and we noticed that at the control temperature, that is at the lower temperature and humidity, they had a higher severity score compared to the ambient temperature. However, the difference between the two groups in the ambient temperature was not significant. Similarly, we subdivided the OSDS uh, questionnaire into the ocular symptom subscale when we analyzed those who were symptomatic in the ocular symptom subscale and those who were normal on the ocular symptom subscale again had a higher severity score at the control temperature and humidity, but the uh, uh, difference in the ambient temperature was not very significant. Similarly, in the vision subscale too, there's a higher rise in severity score at the control temperature, but at ambient temperature, the difference is not much. However, we noticed that in the environmental trigger subscale, there was a drastic and a significant increase in the uh, severity score of those people who were symptomatic on the environmental trigger subscale. So this was a significant finding. So in our study, uh, we showed that the ocular surface temperature variation during the interblink interval was significant in those people who are symptomatic at a lower temperature and humidity condition. Even in our study, it was just a 5 degree change, but they were, uh, the study was significant. We compared it with other studies. Uh, a study done by Craig et al. showed that thermography uh, in case of a dry eye person is more variable compared to a normal. You can see that the color code is more uh, uniform in a normal eye compared to the dry eye patient. Similarly, a study done by Morgan et al. showed that the surface temperature was significantly higher in a dry eye patient. It's probably because of the congestion and that the center of the cornea in a dry eye patient was became much lower than a normal eye. That's probably because of the evaporation rate is higher. And a similar study done by Kamau et al. showed that there was a greater decrease in ocular surface temperature on sustained eye opening, which again supports that there's a higher evaporation rate happening. So we conclude that there's a poor correlation in signs and symptoms in dry eye patients using conventional techniques, which calls for a novel technology to accurately diagnose dry eye. So computerization of the clinical test has helped to increase our efficacy and uh, reduce the time of diagnosis. And recent advances in artificial intelligence and the rapid progression in these analytical techniques have helped us overcome a lot of pitfalls in clinical testing. So ocular surface thermography using severity scores is a novel approach to understand and interpret the dry eye symptoms and reduce a mismatch between the signs and symptoms of the dry eye patients. These are my references. Thank you. Madam, this machine has not come into the market yet. We are still studying the machine, so we haven't put a price on the investigation yet. Uh, yes, we. Uh, this machine was is a collaboration between that and, and even Chaitanya also. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, it's yes earlier. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, sir, because the ocular surface uh, thermography is a sign of, uh, it gives you an idea regarding the homeostasis maintenance. So in those people who have a higher severity score, it shows that the patient is not able to maintain homeostasis. So it definitely is an important parameter to analyze. Yes, sir. In the discussion, you referenced some articles. Did they use the same device? No, sir. They have used another device that is an, uh, using thermography camera itself, but we have used a special de uh, device with multispectral imaging using some thermal sensors, which they have not used. So and this is uh, powered with AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning also. Yeah. So except for, I think, the staining and the osmolarity part, everything else comes into you know, a single unit. Yes, sir. We have so other that's parameters. that's one big advantage yeah. uh, mm -hmm. with this device. Yes, it is a non-invasive T-bud is also right, 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 right. So, so you yeah. just need the osmolarity part which has to be yes. as, as a sort of intervention. So how many patients you have tried this? Uh, so, uh, Ma'am, it's we've done it on 24 patients. Currently, we've taken only volunteers. Yeah, so we have 24. Uh, what's the repeatability of the... Uh, we are, uh, you mean pre-treatment and after treatment? Yes, so currently we have analyzed them before treatment. We yet to uh, further take the study ahead in those ones. Well, before treatment, mm -hmm. one of the brief that you are getting, is mm -hmm. it repeatable? They are similar, ma'am. Did no. you compare that? We did it in few people. It is similar, but uh, there's mild variation based on the temperature. Because many a time when we test the patients, they are coming from a different temperature. They might be sitting in an air-conditioned room or at a normal temperature. That variation is seen. So in, in our uh, study, we had done a temperature control and an ambient temperature. So those are more uh, accurate. But when you uh, randomly measure a person, we don't know from what temperature they're coming from, a, a cold environment or a hot environment. So that variability is there. Mm. So there were a lot of images to use yeah. the AI. Yes. So we're able to easily analyze instead of if each per doctor assessing the machine itself gives us an idea a direct uh, result so it saves us our time also what is the number that you plan to take and uh, because there mm. it come out with some you know authentic and yes. uh, dogmatic result because what madam is saying the mm. test rate variability is very high mm -hmm. so it will be high right yeah. and you need certain number even for artificial intelligence, to come out to a conclusion that, okay, this is the thing mm -hmm. that we have to follow because all will be following the AI. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what is the number that you want to? So ma'am, currently we had used only volunteers, but now we only start trying it on uh, patients. You will be, uh, yeah, you will have certain number, you okay. just check on that. Okay, sure. It will be in thousands, I think minimum thousand or two thousand. They are telling normal, that normal, you have normal, to normal. Okay. Then only you will get the information. Yeah, right? If you don't feel, we will not get. Okay. So how long is the, uh, it has to connect to the internet, is it? it no, it doesn't internet. have internet connection. Currently no, the machine operates and it gives us the data okay. immediately, the report. For analysis. For analysis. Uh, for analysis. Uh, uh, because you are using AI. AI. How it's an inbuilt AI. Yeah, it's an inbuilt AI. So we are not using internet yeah. currently. Yeah. Um, yeah, you need to, to understand that. Statistically. The next sure. part is that. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, the totally different uh, analysis which has to be done for this. Yeah. Now, now we are looking the, at For example, AI. just to compare with the uh, smart vision glass. Mm -hmm. Smart yes. vision glass is available on YouTube. Yes. See that. So mm -hmm. it has to be connected to the uh, internet constantly as the yes. patient is using it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so as to utilize that AI services. Yes. In your system, you say it is already it's built inbuilt, in. Yeah. So it's built in. So what is the stock value? I'm not, I'm yeah, so don't know regarding that. Number of images mm -hmm. are little less. Yes. Then it has to learn more. You may have to feed it more. Yes. That's why companies approach us because they need more images. Yes. So all companies want more images. That's why they approach us. Okay. Our corner department is doing similar study. Not okay. on this. Yeah, they get three okay. images. <laughs> they are uh, taking pictures uh, of keratitis. Okay. Hmm. 
So keratitis, yeah, clinical diagnosis, and then all the images with keratitis, whether okay. it's viral, mm -hmm. uh, fungal, or whatever, mm -hmm. they're collecting, and the number that is fixed is 2,000. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Are we proceeding? Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, Google, Google has a prognosis. Ah. Uh, Google has a lab in Bangalore, mm -hmm. which does for dermatology. Okay. Mm -hmm. For each skin lesion they have for dermatology. They do yeah. check them in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. So all this diabetic images are small values Correct. compared to <laughs> dermatology. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank okay, you. Thank thank you. you. Uh, before I call the next uh, candidate, uh, do we wait for the people who are absent, madam? Oh, oh. Then uh, we I call upon Dr. Savia Soman to present FP227, comparative analysis of two different posterior chamber taking lenses for correction of myopia. Good morning. So uh, I'll be talking about a comparative analysis of two different posterior chamber fakic lenses for the correction of myopia. So no financial interest. So a fakic lenses uh, implantation is a procedure of choice when it comes to the correction of high refractive errors and the advantages being it can correct high refractive error, it preserves accommodation, has a faster visual recovery and it is a reversible process. So the aim of the study was to compare the implantable columnar lens by the uh, uh, Star Surgicals in Switzerland and the implantable FICI contact lenses by the care uh, group in India. And the inclusion, it is a retrospective case series and uh, inclusion criteria included all eyes who are in whom the uh, FICI lenses were implanted during the study period with a minimum of one year follow-up. And the exclusion criteria was any previous ocular surgeries, hypermetropia, unstable refraction and less than one year of follow-up. And the data were collected from the EMR uh, preoperatively and then at one month, six months, and at one year and the last visit. And the uncorrected vis and uh, corrected visual equities, uh, subjective and objective refraction, the slit lamp evaluation, the intraocular pressure, endothelial density was calculated in each visit. And additionally, horizontal white to white diameter was calculated with digital calipers and anterior chamber depth and keratometry from the uh, IOL master and uh, uh, was collect collected preoperatively and the volt was calculated postoperatively. So the type of fake lenses to be implanted was decided by the patient, which most probably might have been influenced by the cost in that ICL is costlier than IPCL. And uh, uh, patients with who had a uh, uh, manifest cylinder more than 0.5 diopter had toric fake lens implantation, others had a spherical fake lenses. And the customization of the fake lenses was done by the company based on the data provided. The statistical analysis was done using the SPSS 20 version and uh, Wilkinson sign rank test and Man Whitney U test was used to compare the statistical significance. So our study included 65 patients uh, for, with 40 in the ICL and 25 in the IPSL group, and that is 116 eyes of the uh, 69 in ICL and 20, 47 in IPCL group. The mean age was 26 in both the, both the groups, and the mean spherical equivalent was minus 8 in ICL and minus 11 in IPCL. And toric fake lenses was implanted in 64 uh, ICL patients and 42 IPCL patients. The mean follow-up for ICL was 22 and uh, the IPCL patients had a uh, higher follow-up of 35 months. So the uncorrected visual acuity in the both the groups showed uh, statistically significant improvement from a preoperative vision of 1.28 to a postoperative lockmar of 0.23. And uh, this graph we, we can see that 85.4% uh, percentage of the ICL and 78.8% percentage in the IPCL had a, uh, maintained their preoperative BCVA or had a gain of lines Pre uh, when compared to the preoperative BCVA in when the uh, postoperative in the postoperative UCVA, and the percentage of eyes achieving emetropia was 55% in the ICL and 60% in the IPCL, and those with a spherical equivalent less than 0.5 diopter was 72% in the ICL and 88% in the IPCL, and there was no statistical significance between them. The volt was seen to decrease from uh, one month to the last follow-up period in both the groups. And uh, uh, specular count was also found to decrease with a regression rate of 7.5 in ICL and 7.1 in the IPCL. 
coming to the complications, uh, one patient in the ICL had to undergo uh, lens exchange due to a low, uh, low volt and uh, one patient in the IPCL had rotational instability and one in the ICL had residual error. Both of which didn't go for uh, resurgeries. Cataract was there in two of the ICL and three of the IPCL patients and one patient uh, of IPCL had pupillary block glaucoma and uh, uh, transient IUPRIs due to steroids were seen in six of the ICL and four of the IPCL patients. The safety index, which is the ratio of the mean preoperative BCVA to the postoperative BCVA, was 1.09 in the ICL and 1.12 in the IPCL. And the efficacy index, which is the ratio of the mean, uh, mean uh, postoperative UCVA to the preoperative BCVA, was 0.86 in the ICL and 0.89 in the IPCL groups. So the improvement seen in the BCVA and UCVA was consistent with that of the published literature. And uh, the gain of the lines in the uh, postoperative uncorrected visual acuity when compared to the preoperative uh, best corrected visual acuity might be due to the fact that this phacic lenses causes the image formation which is closer to the nodal point. And it was seen that uh, 85.4, uh, it was such a gain of line was uh, reported by Sachdev et al. in their study also. There was loss of two, more than two lines in five of the patients of which four, four was due to progression of myopia and one was due to the rotation of the lens. And those which, uh, and the spherical, a percentage with residual spherical equivalent less than 0.5 diopter, that was also comparable to the previous studies as required, uh, done by Sachdev et al. in their one year follow up. And about the incidence of cataract, uh, post, post operatively after one year, there was posterior, uh, PAC was observed in two patients of ICL and uh, two patients of IPCL group. And one patient in IPCL had a late onset uh, fa uh, vis visually insignificant faint anterior subcapsular haze. So in the, those two, uh, where the, it was visually significant, phacic IOL explantation with the phacic emulsification and cataract uh, IOL implantation was done. And about the resurgeries, one patient uh, due to low volt had underwent resurgeries and one patient uh, post IPCL and IC, uh, ICL had a residual error which did not go for resurgeries. The transient IOP rise uh, in IPCL was due to an inadequate pupillary uh, uh, peripheral iridectomy which was in the older version of the IPCL which was correct, uh, corrected by enlarging the iridectomy and the transient IOP rise uh, seen uh, was usually uh, it subsided with, uh, with, uh, with the withdrawal of the steroids. And the safety indexes and the efficacy indices in our study are comparable to those studies that has been reported previously. And uh, previous studies has also reported that the volt is seen progressively decreasing over the follow-up, which is also similar in our study. And the endothelial cell regression is most happening in the one, first one year and has been reported to be between 5.5 to 8.5 percentage. And in our study, it is coming to 7.5 and 7.1 in ICL and IPCL group. And the merits of the study, our study is that uh, it is uh, only one previous study has been there in the literature which is comparing the ICL and IPCL and that was for one year. So our study has a comparatively higher follow up. The limitation of the study is its retrospective nature. And to conclude, there is no statistical significant difference in the outcomes between IPCL and ICL and both exhibit comparable safety and efficacy in treating myopia. And having said that, IPCL may be a, a better option in patients who are due to, uh, who may, may who want a better refractive correction in a, and financial uh, constraints may not affect them. Thank you. These are my reference. Both your study and uh, the other lady's study are from the same center? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So much of variation in both the studies? Uh, <laughs> hers was three months follow-up and I included minimum one month follow -up, one year follow-up. Yeah. Okay. Because the incidence of glaucoma and all is totally yes. different. <laughs> Patients must have overlapped. Uh, th and that was... Study yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, because uh, these no, patients who had uh, minimum, <laughs> since I included minimum one one year follow up, most uh, some of the patients who actually had complications uh, in the initial period who didn't turn up for follow up in the later had been missed in the study. So mm. that is well, that might be the reason. Some few cases have been missed because they didn't come for the total one year follow up. Uh, how do you what? How do you say? Uh, you know, resolve the fact that uh, IPCL patients have better follow-up than ICL patients. In your group, I, IPCL have uh, better follow-up than ICL actually patients. Actually, that is just an incidental happening. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just... What do you think are the, could be the reasons? I can't think of anything. <laughs> okay. How the 
patient chose the lens, is it? Yes, ma'am. Actually, the initial lens which came up in IPCL had many... Uh, that ha that didn't... You are showing less. Uh, that is why, ma'am, uh, we had complications so in the first three months. Uh, because this one year I had, in, uh, I wanted a minimum one year follow-up, many of the cases had to be excluded. You should tell the you denominator, include, uh, include the include denominator. You should tell us what are the total number of procedures done during that period, study okay. period. Yeah. Uh, yes. Can you go back to the first, uh, you tell us what is the denominator, then you can tell what is the numerator you have studied. Oh. So you can have worst case scenario and the best case scenario. In that situation, you have to see. So number of patients 65, number of pi is 116. So, but how many were done during that? study period yes uh, what was the denominator you remember because she had a higher denominator huh. but the study period is different yours is yeah. your study is uh, different when was hers i think it was 2000 yeah from two, this is from january 2015 yeah study period no what i think is i don't know i'm just thinking now we are looking at something different, comparative of two designs or two techniques. I think we should include the early post -op Okay, form. yes ma'am. So, both of us mark the ACN required rotation. Uh, I didn't understand your question, sir. The rig that come with IPCL are smart the rig. Ah, yes sir. Yeah, IPCL is... ICL, you had ICL had to be rotated. And the rotation issue, yeah, you yeah, had a bridge box. IPCL. Uh, uh, yeah, one IPCL will have to dish. The corneal diameter and uh, all those measurements. Ah, white to white was measured using digital calipers. Uh, sir, uh, one person only, the yes, operating sir. surgeon only uh, measured it. So sometimes if uh, the surgeon is busy, the assistant uh -huh. <laughs> measures, no. there could be a disparity probably. That is what I'm saying. That, that disparity is there. Yes, ma'am. So it's caliper based? Digital caliper based. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir.